Hey guys, I'm back. I know it doesn't seem like I was really gone, but for me, it <laughs> seems like an eternity. For the last eight days, I've been living at my sister and brother-in-law's place and taking care of my elderly mother while they went to Spain. Uh, and I was also working a full-time job remotely while doing so. <laughs> oh, some nights I got about two hours of sleep, so I'm very punchy, very sleep-deprived. But I'm also really itching to get back into the workshop and do something. While I was in exile, I ordered up a bunch of parts. One is for the Filco. The owner gave me the green light to restore the Filco that has the bum pitcher tube and some cabinet issues. So that's what I'm going to do in this video. I want to dive into it. I also got parts for two of his other sets that are coming up. Emerson 571 and RCA 8241. So we're going to start out by digging in to this nice big package that arrived from Mauser Electronics. And then my goal is to dive deep into this Filco and start recapping it. First off, a few updates from the last installment. One, I showed you this knob I pulled out of my stash and said that it was for this set. It's not. As one of you pointed out, it's for our older sets, like a Philco 491040. In other words, a 4849 set's not a 1950 set. This set would not have had the wings on it. Still don't find my box of Philco knobs. It's down here somewhere. Uh, but I also, I think from the same guy who told me I had the wrong knob, thinks he might be able to find me a set of knobs. But he's waiting for me to find mine and see what I have and don't have. But... Uh, the point is, I think we'll be able to get a full set of knobs without too much trouble. I also got a line on a potential replacement pitcher tube if I can't dig up one of my own. So all that is great. Uh, so we're going to dive into this. Um, I'm hoping, ideally, in this video, we're going to try powering it up. In other words, tonight I'm going to try powering this up. One of you left a comment that... Maybe something bad happened with the AC interlock here, and that's where this corrosion came from. Maybe, maybe. What's also possible is the power cords back then were made out of some kind of early vinyl, I imagine. And they could, the plasticizers could leach out and they would get sticky, and it could get corrosive. And I've seen some really badly corroded brass terminals because of that plastic. So it could just have been the, from the cord pressing against this and deteriorating the cause of this or yeah it's possible because when corrosion starts down here you start getting electrical resistance and if you turn the set on this can get hot and you can the plasticizers and plastic and start smoking maybe even catch on fire so this could also be from the nasty chemicals burning off the plastic to cause this corrosion so uh, I'll do my best to clean this off I may have to replace this AC interlock but first, let's see what the capacitor ferry brought us. Spent a bit of time on the Mauser website because I <laughs> was kind of trapped at my sister's place. Uh, choosing parts. Choosing parts. So there should be caps for three sets. Some parts I knew I had on hand, but a bunch I figured I didn't. In particular, some of the caps on this set you need 500 volt caps. But I also realized that some of them don't, even though they use 500 volt caps. Well, let's look at the power supply in a bit and I'll show you why. Is they, most of these caps are three or four section electrolytics. And typically, they're all the same voltage. They're all 450, they're all 500. That doesn't mean all the caps have to be 500. And in particular, I think that's the case in this. 500 volt caps can get expensive, especially for the larger capacitances. So... I will show you what I bought and explain why as we go through this. But basically, a lot of caps. Mauser is a good... Well, <laughs> I don't quite understand Mauser's packing. So some electrolytics are just in a baggie. It's fine. These are from 82 microfarad 450 volt caps, for example. Some of them are in bubble wrap. Why are some on bubble wrap and some are? I don't know. These are 4.7 microfarad 50 volt caps. They're tiny, they're nothing special, but they got the bubble wrap treatment. 
So, the 47, four, the 47 microfarad 500 volt caps got bubble wrap. The 450 volt caps did not. Now, I said they, these do cost a bit more, but you know, not that much more. But maybe they figure since they're primo caps, they should bubble wrap them. I don't know. It's actually just one cap in there. So, yeah, you can get 500 volt niche kind electrolytic caps. A little bit more hydrogen than a 450 volt cap. But for that extra 50 volts, expect to spend, I don't know, 50% more for the cap, something like that. I got a whole bunch of 47. So let's, let's do a little comparison. So these are 47 450s. Let's see how 47 450 compares to a 47 500. Here, let's compare apples to apples. So these are both 47 microfarad Nichi Con, very similar specs, 500 volt 450. So, considerably larger diameter just to get 50 more volts. Anyways, that's what the specs called for in a few instances and I thought they were warranted, so that's what I got. Are also some power resistors that are crucial, so I ordered up some nice high quality ones. More caps, more caps, more caps. Should be a bag of 10 microfarad 500 volt caps somewhere around here. Yeah, here we go. These actually aren't too bad. If you buy 10 of these at once, I think they're 90 cents each. 10 microfarad 500 volt. So, we have a whole lot of caps to replace, is what it comes down to. Hmm, here's a closer look at that. AC interlock, and you know, that might be a replacement. I say that because it has nuts and screws on it. Usually they're riveted in place. But that makes my job a lot easier. Assuming I can find my nut driver. I can just remove it. And I'll clip the wires off. I have a... Uh, Several new old stock replacements that are uh, identical, so I want to leave the wires as long as possible, so I'm going to clip the lugs rather than clipping the wires. On, let's get that guy out. I'm going to take a closer <laughs> look at the, uh, oh my, yeah, that's a little bit corroded. Alright, we got one. Oh yeah, this guy did burn up. See the phenolic is rather charred on the other side. And what's corroded here, these are actually the... What's left of the power cord fused to the pins. I'm going to get that off. Yeah, so that's the pin. Uh, and this, this is what would have been inside the nylon power cord that would plug into that. Tell you what, I'm going to replace that right now. Here's a new old stock AC interlock. I still have to remove some corrosion, but I want to be able to safely, reliably apply power right now. So I'm going to install this guy, all the mounting holes and line up. I'll connect up these two leads and dig up a power cord. I highly recommend, regardless of what type of engine electronics you work on, get yourself a screw, machine screw assortment. In particular, 630 seconds, I find to be very useful. That is what I just used to attach that guy. Now I'm going to get this off the workbench. Let's get the cabinet up here and extract that pitcher tube and see what we can rig up. And this can go in the trash. All right, let's see about getting this out. Once we do, not only can I... So we're on a chassis, but I can start doing some cabinet repairs too. So let's 
see if I'm getting this out of here. We got a couple choices. We can remove it from here and leave these attached to this so we can remove this from this. I'm going to take these nuts off. Alright, got those two nuts off. Now I'm going to remove these supports from the cabinet. I don't want them entirely out of the way while I work on this stuff. Remember the CRT is held up front so it's not going to come crashing down just because I took that support off. So I need to do some clamping on this left hand side here. secured up front by three big bolts up front before we lose any of our hardware let's put these washers and nuts back on all right so this CRT has lost its vacuum now could it be rebuilt potentially just because the phosphor gets exposed to air doesn't mean it's necessarily completely shot but it's not a good thing. I think sometimes they may have sprayed a clear coat over them, so even if they were exposed to air, because after all, when they coated the phosphor, they did it with it being exposed to air. But the reality is 12 LP4s aren't exactly rare, so I don't think it's worth saving. But anyways, there she is, and it is a little bit heavy, but I got it, I got it. My cabinet probably weighs nothing at all now. This down carefully on the side, and uh, let's get all the before. I'm gonna reattach the nut and the washer right where they were, so we can't possibly lose anything, right? Let's see. Yeah, cabinet probably weighs less than 10 pounds now. Be a lot easier to work on. Also means I can finally clean the screen plastic safety cover, which is quite dirty. There's one nut that needs to get reattached. There's another. Alright, that was fairly easy. Well, the fun part comes. I was trying to rig this up so we can power it up. believe the main thing we have to do is loosen this up and she all comes apart. 5 sixteenths. Yes. Well, that's it. It's just one of them. A little crusty. There's some padding on here that's kind of fused the metal to the glass. It's moving a little bit. Oh, we might need to loosen that up. So the yoke. I don't think so though, but generally this stuff's all adjustable so it can move a little bit around the neck. So I don't, I don't think any of this is going to be firmly attached to the CRT. Now I may have fused to it over the years. Kind of thinking, yeah, this should just lift off. Worst case scenario, yeah, I could whack the CRT with a hammer and shatter the whole thing, but let's not get crazy. There we go. That's what I was hoping for. And yeah, sadly, this I think will go in the garbage. Check out that phosphor. That is definitely degraded from being exposed to the elements. Let's see if we can get a focus on that. Check that out. It's all it's all crazed and, and cracked. This yellowness, I think, is just you know, cigarette smoke residue, whatever. That would probably clean off. But inside, yeah, I mean, that phosphor is shot. So there is no sense in hanging on to this. 
Oh yeah, you can see the getters. Yeah, the getters tried to do its job, but um, the air rushed in. That uh, all turned white. That's what happens. The reactive material there. All right, let's get that out of here. And by the way, my sister did pick me up a lovely gift from Spain. I'm wondering if any of you know who this guy is. Who is doing his business? Everybody needs one of these. I have an idea. I do have, uh, what's it called, a telematic uh, external CRT yoke rig that has alligator clips so you can clip into circuit just for cases like this. Question is, is the yoke inside of it compatible with this and can I run this safely without the focus coil attached? Let's take a quick look at the schematic. Yeah, we're going to need a, that focus coil, I think. So where's the power supply? There's the focus coil. It connects to 330 volt bus, which is the main thing coming out of the rectifier, filter choke, there's 330. It goes through the focus coil and that gives us 310. Now it's in parallel with the focus control, so that'll have some continuity going through there. But we need something here too. Probably 50 ohm, 100 ohm resistor, something like that will do the job. This is what I was getting at earlier about the secondary uh, center tap. It's not going to ground. It goes through a 15 ohm resistor to ground. And that develops a negative 4 volt bias voltage. It also means that these two filter caps forming the pie filter with that choke don't go to ground. They go to that 15 ohm resistor. Now this guy. So right off the 5U4 cathode 30 microfarad. That gets hit and you turn the set on and it's not drawing full power. That's where you want your 500 volt cap for sure. Now they also spec'd one out here and I believe I did pick one up for that. But all these other caps downstream like this guy, I think 450 will be sufficient. Because this focus coil and this, there's resistance there and that's going to drop the voltage there. And likewise these other caps. So I, I think even though they spec'd out 500 volt caps for a bunch of these. I think the only ones that are really critical are these two right here. All right, let's get back to powering this up. I'm initially going to try powering it up without the rectifier. So we're going to pop this guy out. And we are missing at least one tube. And some of these were loose and I just popped them in. I want to make sure we have the correct tubes and the correct sockets. We might as well test them while we're at it too. And I don't want to turn this on. I want to check a few things. One, well, actually, yeah, before I even test the tubes, we'll try turning it on. I want to see, is this thing even good? This power transformer. Something smoked. We could have a dead short of the primary. Yeah, that would be a problem. There's supposed to be a fuse in this, according to that schematic we just looked at. I'm not sure where it is. I think it's inside this, but it wouldn't surprise me if somebody shorted it out with a hunk of 14-gauge wire or something like that. Uh, we're going to see if the power switch is good and we should see the tube filaments light up and we can check the unloaded secondary voltage on this power transformer too. So, let's wow, I'm so glad I'm double checking this because the 5U4 that I just plucked out from over there is actually supposed to be in over here. That should be a 6SN7. Uh, <laughs> there's some tubes missing under these shields. This is a whole bunch of 6BC5s, which is new to me. I'm used to 6AU6s or 6AG5s. I'm missing one of them, so I gotta check my tube stash. A little cobweb. 12AU7, is that right? Yeah. 12AU7 video detector. Alright. Alright, I have all the correct tube types in the sockets, except for the 5U4. I use a little deoxit. In the tube sockets and work the tubes in and out a couple times to make sure the contacts were clean. Let's try powering it up. Got a new old stock cheater cord here. Let's plug that into our replaced AC interlock. On the back. Plug that into my trusty PR57. Set is off, PR57 is off, PR57 is on, killing lights so we can see tubes glow, hopefully. And here we go, 3, 2, 1, contact, and nothing. 
Okay, a few possibilities. One, we saw there was a fuse on the schematic, so let's track that down and see if it's uh, where it is and if it's good or not. Two, it could always be a bad power switch. And three, could have a flaky AC interlock, some wiggling mats. You see, the uh, cheater cord is in there pretty solidly. Look at the power switch. It was corroded doing this a few times should take care of that so I think we got something else going on so let's get this thing on its side and investigate underneath well the power switch is bad I'm checking for continuity right across it so I got one probe on the AC interlock one side of the AC switch continuity here's the other side of the AC switch and Nothing. I've done this about a hundred times. So, what's hmm? I'm just gonna unmount this, but it's attached to components that have kind of stubby leads. Uh, I guess we're just gonna short that sucker out, or I'm gonna move a lead from one side to the other, and I'll rely on my PR57 for the power switch. Okay, power switch has been bypassed. I also realized when I looked at the schematic again, the fuse is on the secondary side, which is kind of unusual, but they fused the B plus center tap, so the fuse, there's no fuse on the primary, so that's not an issue. Here we go. Oh, that's what I wanted to see. Current went up, came down, holding at a reasonable level. My goodness, we don't have a shorted power transformer. Tubes are glowing, even the 7F8 uh, Lochtal tube. Uh, some of these guys, oh, they're, they're coming up. Some of these tubes on the left hand side seem a little dim. They're coming. So maybe this guy, the 6, oh, it's lighting up now too. Check how much, maybe a primary voltage is a little low. Oh, it is. I'm going down to 105 to get that up. We should be glowing a little bit brighter. All right. Isn't that a beautiful sight? So, our concerns were unwarranted. At least, uh, we don't have a short of primary, and we have a filament secondary that's good. Do we have a high voltage secondary that's good? We can do that. It's an unloaded test, but it's, a, it's still has some merit. We're going to stick our AC voltmeter down into the 5U4 socket pins and see what we get. Please have pin numbers on the schematic. Oh, thank you. Thank you for pin numbers on the schematic. Pins 4 and 6 out of plates. Fantabulous. Yeah, it's a generally a tube set seems around 7, 750 is what you typically see across the entire secondary. In other words, 350 AC on the other side of the center tap. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, can I pop in a 5U4 and just let it rip? Yeah, I could, but what's really going to happen? We don't have a CRT, we don't have a yoke. Uh, maybe we get a crackle out of the speaker. High voltage? Maybe. That's the one thing I'm curious about. Uh, but I also have to repair, if you recall, the, uh, there's a plate cap. It's broken off, I think, on the 1B3 in there. So we have work to do inside this guy before we can do that. Um, so maybe I was a little bit over-ambitious and thinking we'd see a raster tonight. Uh, now, as I said, I do have a test rig with alligator clips, and I can clip it in for the yoke connections and for the CRT connections. Uh, nice if I had an octal adapter rigged up, and I could just plug it into that, and away we go, but I don't. Um, yeah, but first, let's, let's get in here, because there's no way anything's going to work if we don't fix the damage inside this box. But hey, isn't that... A lovely sight with a minimal amount of work. 
managed to get the high voltage cage off without too much trouble. I had mentioned earlier that there's a chain that attaches the top to the side. I spread open uh, the end link for the top part and removed it because I want to start removing the rust so I have it working with some navel jelly right now and I'll do similar corrosion removal on this. Well, meanwhile, let's check this out. That's something new for me. So many of these early sets use a similar flyback to what RCA introduced with their early sets known as Fly One and the Thord Arson Replacement Guide. But this is different. Well, it has a laminated iron frame, but the appearance of it, the way the coils are laid out, the construction, it's all a little bit different. I haven't not seen a flyback quite like this before. We can do some basic resistance checks to see if it's any good. Here's that fuse that, uh, well, there should be two fuses in this. One on the B plus. This will be a fuse just for the flyback. I want to do something about this once we get the set working. This got mushed down a little bit. I mean, it won't work, but it'd be nice to figure out or get it uh, leveled out. Um, you know, more remains of a candy wrapper down there. It was a Hershey's Kiss. I found a <laughs> label on it. Now we can blow all that dust out of there. There's our high voltage doorknob cap. Uh, there's our high voltage current limiting resistor, 680K. There's our high voltage lead, 6BQ6. Huh, that ain't right. That ain't right. Yeah, so that was rattling around in the set. I say that right because that's a much bigger cap than will fit on there, but also 6BQ6 is too new. I mean, maybe it would kind of sort of work, but I'm pretty sure this uses a 6BG6. But let's, let's, let's double check that with our tube chart. So top view. Uh, 6BG6G. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what always always sets to use, so that, that's not right. But what's also odd is 6BG6 is a really tall tube. And I'll pull it out in a sec. That's not going to fit in there. Well, here is a classic 6BG6. Let's clean it up a little bit. Pulled it out of my used stash. I want to get the G type that it says it used, which is the original, which is big. It's much bigger than all these other tubes we're looking at. Well, that was a 6BG6G. Uh, oh! I see. Yet again, we have tubes in the wrong socket. Ooh! <laughs> I think our 1B3 is no, is no good. <laughs> okay, so we had high voltage rectifier in the horizontal output tube socket. Ah, it's making sense now. So this goes over here, and this is probably the cap for the high voltage tube, and the cap that's broken off is actually the one for the 6 BG6. It's really important to get these right, otherwise this is not going to work, and we could kill the flyback. Well, here's a 1B3. Uh, I've said this before, I want to say it again. I hear guys all the time saying they have buckets of 1B3s, they've got no use for them, they have no value. I would be happy to take any 1B3 new old stock tubes you guys might have, and I will pay you for them. But nobody ever takes me up on that offer. <laughs> <laughs> I got plenty of used ones. I want new old stock in the box and ideally the old school tall type. But 1B3 slash 1G3, the shorter ones, that'd be fine too. So if any of you guys have buckets or boxes of new old stock, high voltage rectifier, 1B3, 1G3, 1J3, 1K3, get in contact with me. I'll take them off your hands. Alright, so that goes like that. We need to find a cap for that. As luck would have it, I can't find any right now. I thought I had when I found this, but this is for the smaller cap types. It won't fit. So, we're going to improvise. I just stripped off some solid bus wire. 
and we're simply going to twist it so that it's on there pretty securely and we're going to strip the end of this off we're going to splice them together and that'll do for now yes of course I will replace it with a more appropriate well <laughs> not even more appropriate but this wire is so brittle that's what happens with this old crusty wire inside the high voltage box Deteriorates. There we go. We're just going to splice these together for now. This will have something like 12,000 volts on it. This will have 1,500 or so, so it's not quite as intense. This will do for now. I've got some nice wire I can replace this with and run it down through and attach it to the flyback. So, But in the interest of giving this a go. So the only concern right now about powering this up without a yoke or without that plug attached is that focus coil. Hmm. Well you know, huh, I think I can bring over that whole big hoop assembly and plug it in. We'll give that a try. Running a set without horizontal and vertical deflection uh, yokes attached, it's not great, it's like running an amplifier without a speaker connected, you know, loading it. Uh, it should be able to produce high voltage. Solar. Let's group and tack this together. And swing that assembly over and see if we can plug it all together. And if so, we are going to try to slowly bring this guy up and see what's what. And if all goes well, we should get some high voltage coming out of here, which we can check by bringing a fluorescent tube near this assembly. Yeah, it's kind of stretching it a bit, but you can plug this in and have this off to the side. Of course, there's the picture too, but it completes the circuit for the horizontal, vertical deflection coils and the focus coil. I've got it plugged in. Well, let's go. Then I put the 5U4 back in. No tubes have been tested. We're kind of going to take, uh, let's give it a try and see what happens. Approach here. I've got my Variac basically at zero volts, so let's turn that up a bit. Okay, we're drawing some current. We're at uh, 35 volts or so. Barely drawing any current. So I'm going to keep slowly doing this, and if the current gets excessive, I'm going to stop. Or so the smokes, of course, will stop. But otherwise, we go up on the Variac. And the current draw goes up, and it should drop back down. And then we increase the variac and the current should go up and then drop back down a bit. And we keep doing that until something happens. Well, we're up to about 80, 85 volts AC coming in and check it out. Here's my fluorescent tube. Bring it by the flyback. Yeah. Whoa! I was not expecting that. You get my high voltage probe, see if I can have some high voltage. Ah, that was a complicated bit. I'm back to, okay, even if all that does work, how do we actually hook up a pitcher tube and see? Well, okay, I got an idea. All right, let's keep going with this. Maybe I will get a raster tonight after all. Okay, we are up to... Uh, about 110 volts being fed into the set. It's drawing a little over one and a half amps and we're putting out 6.3 kilovolts. Not as much as it should be, but that's respectable considering we haven't done anything. So I want to try to rig up a 5AXP4 test CRT. I'm going to tilt this thing on its side, slide the CRT through, hook up the base connector. Now the electromagnetic 
focus coil shouldn't be there when you use a test CRT because it has built-in focus, autofocus. So that may cause a problem, but I'm hoping if I can get a glow on the face of the CRT, I will call this a very good night's work, and then I'm going to dive into doing the recapping. Well, it may look a little unconventional, but there's a little baby bench test 5A XP4 CRT installed in the 12 LP4 mounting hoop going through the yoke and everything and the back is connected up and the high voltage lead is connected up I have it propped up on a plastic container and the front hoop is balanced against the frame of the speaker what could go wrong? let's give this a try no knobs, I don't know what the controls are so we're going to have to suss out what is brightness and contrast and all that stuff CRT filament is glowing excellent there's my high voltage probe here and you can check the high voltage we've got our 6 kilovolts I need to reduce the lighting even more I think there we go okay <laughs> That'll be the volume control. <laughs> oh, and that would be brightness. Holy cow. Or one of these is brightness and one of these is contrast, I expect. Maybe, or maybe focus. Son of a gun. Okay, this is probably vertical hold. This could be maybe horizontal hold. But none of that really matters. The point is, the point is, we have a glow on the face of the CRT running on all the original capacitors and tubes. So why did I go through this exercise? I went through this exercise, well, because the owner didn't see a lot of promise in this set. I had to sort of persuade him that it was worth restoring. So I wanted to find out if any of the major components were bad with a minimal amount of work. Because uh, he's paying me to restore this set, and if I put a ton of work into it, and I find out the power transformer's fried, and then he doesn't want to f invest the time and money to get a replacement, I'm going to eat that. Well, normally it wouldn't go quite this far. Um, so what I would normally do is find out that, okay, the owner wants the set restored, and that's that. And then if anything like the power transformer is bad, I would track one down. Uh, but in this case, I wanted to find out as soon as possible if there were any major problems. And I don't think we do. Now, we don't have four vertical deflections, so something like the vertical blocking, oscillator transformer could be bad. I mean, there could be some minor things, but we know power transformer appears to be fine. Flyback appears to be fine. Yoke appears to be okay. I've never found a bad yoke, so that was the least of my concerns. But considering we had that, <laughs> it was a down, uh, an outright fire in this area, that had me a little concerned, so we know we have a bad power switch. That I'm going to have to figure out. It's a combination of power volume with this, a certain kind of shaft on it. Hopefully I can pop this open, clean, uh, clean up the contacts or something like that and resurrect it. But otherwise, we are good to go. So I'm going to leave off here, and I am going to dive into working on this. I've already threw some navel jelly on the rusty parts on the high-voltage box. I'm going to start recapping this guy.